respected professor and my dear students i welcome you all to this new session with new batch of students uh, we have ongoing academic activities for the past two years with the assignment of our professor dr sami sir and uh, professor asim madam and with very enthusiastic pg students who have brought a lot of new talents to our field and uh, future uh, our fraternity depends a lot on you so i wish all the best for all of you and get make uh, get maximum value out of your time being spent in this classes here so without my wasting much of your time today i wish to invite you for the first session of this new academic year uh, today's topic will be very basic very useful and professor has uh, conceived it in such a wonderful way i hope it's going to be a really entertaining and exciting session for you uh, it's a respiratory applied anatomy and physiology for anesthesiologists over to professor and students thank you sir thank you sir thank you thank you very much and uh, <clears throat> a small uh, correction in your announcement uh, this is uh, i am not including anatomy topics today as i told dr vidya earlier uh, we will discuss uh, most of the physiology topics pertaining to respiratory system which are of importance to anesthetists both from practical point of view in managing a case as well as from exam point of view so it will be uh, instead of a didactic lecture going on for uh, one and a half hours two hours i thought it will be useful if we make it interactive so that uh, you can also assess your knowledge or your uh, learning of respiratory system during your both undergraduate days or your uh, pg period in this uh, one year because now if you are asha with me all these people have now come to the second year after completing the first year so they have fairly uh, some amount of experience in uh, handling Uh, patients with respiratory system problems in the ICU as well as in the anesthesia when they come for incidental surgeries. So, with this in mind, we will uh, just go this uh, approach this topic. Uh, there are a few common, repeatedly asked theory questions in this basic sciences part of respiratory system. Uh, if you go through the old question banks, they ask about uh, the control of respiration how our respiration is controlled physiology of respiratory control they ask you about the dead space importance of dead space to anesthesia they ask you about the importance of functional residual capacity and closing capacity in the relationship they also ask you with regard to how oxygen is transported in the blood by the effect of respiratory system and carbon dioxide is eliminated because the primary function as all of you know is uh, delivery of oxygen to the tissues and removal of carbon dioxide created by the aerobic metabolism at the level of the mitochondria that is the basic function of our respiratory system and sometimes they ask you about non respiratory functions of the lung also so non respiratory functions are also there so that is also one of the common questions ask the theory examination so this class will focus both on theory aspects of the respiratory system which we all have to know and also how this frc the dead space all these things play a very important role in the management of your anesthesia and your knowledge of ventilating the patient uh, both in the intensive care unit as well as in the operation theater for major surgeries so with that in mind i will just share my screen with you and uh, to be some sort of uh, small question and answers and uh, are you able to see the screen yes sir yes, sir. yes. so first uh, topic we are going to discuss is physiological control of respiration so the first question comes to you is how does spontaneous respiration occur anybody who knows the answer can unmute and start answering the question how does spontaneous respiration occur what is the mechanism yes 
brain center. Huh? Stimulating the brain center. Pain. Do you have a pain? Brain center. Brain, brain center. Okay, central nervous system control. Central. Okay. Uh, that is two chemi uh, chemical and neural regulation. Ah, regulation that is, is the there. Code, the pons matrix. Very good. So both of them are important. So spontaneous respiration occurs as a result of rhythmic discharge of motor neurons innervating the respiratory muscles. So the nerve impulses from the brain are responsible for this rhythmic changes. Your answer is correct. It is from the brain and there is a rhythmic that is, it should stimulate the inspiratory center first, then stop that and then stimulate the expiratory center because there are two different centers, one for inspiration and one for mm -hmm. expiration. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, that should go on a rhythmic scale. Now the next question that comes is, how is this rhythmic discharge from brain regulated? Brain media, factor, that, neurotransmitter, huh? that neurotransmitter is... Neurotransmitters. That is the nerve, that is for nerve conduction. Okay, sir. But how does the body or brain decide that inspiration should go on for such and such seconds or minutes and then it should stop and then it should change over to spread reflex, sir. Reflex Hearing mechanism. Reflex mechanism. So very, uh, the main thing is about art. PaO2 and TCO2 and hydrogen ion. These are the three things which are very, very important for chemical control of respiration. So once the arterial, because I told you the main function of respiratory system is to deliver the oxygen and remove the carbon dioxide. To remove the carbon dioxide, some amount of hydrogen ion is produced. How, how hydrogen ion is produced from carbon dioxide? It combines with water. Ah, majority of it is combining with water to form a weak acid called carbonic acid. Carbonic acid. And this carbonic acid is immediately broken down into hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ion by an enzyme called carbonic anhydride. And again, it will be reverted back. The same formula will be reverted back to make it a gas. And then once at the lung level, it will be eliminated. So these three things are very, very important for this rhythmic discharge. So, but also there should be a neuronal feedback loop. With what are its components? So even though these three factors, that is oxygen, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen play a very important role in the rhythmic discharge of the, uh, between the inspiration and expiration, a neuronal feedback is also there. From the periphery, it goes to the brain, and uh, mm -hmm. initiates the inspiration, stops it at a particular level after the achievement of oxygenation, then it stimulates the expiratory center to facilitate removal of carbon dioxide. So this, normally, we, when we talk about any reflex arc, what are all the components of a reflex arc? Effector organ. Uh, there will be an apparent, there will be a center, there will be an effector. Uh, more or less the same thing is here. So respiration is controlled through neuronal feedback loops. These loops are comprised of control center, sensors and effectors. So instead of apparent, we say there are sensors which take the message to the control center. Control center causes the effect by effectors. So instead of apparent, center and different, we have a little change in the apparent terminology, which is called sensor, which takes the message to the control center, and from there it is uh, passed back to the organ by effectors. So this is how the feedback loop works. Which parts of the nervous system are responsible for this neural control of respiration? Medulla. Only medulla? Yeah. You can see the word, wording is parts, not just part. If I ask which part, you can say just middle lab, but the question itself gives you there is a plural. Which parts of the nervous system are responsible for this? Pons, medulla, and only these two? No, sir, another two. Another two. 
What are the another two? Okay, the cerebral okay. cortex, medulla, and pons. Okay, in the medulla and pons, you have four different centers: inspiratory center, expiratory center, apneustic center, and uh, the uh, the fourth center. So there are uh, individual neurons collected there. So, but the main three components are cerebral cortex is also very important. Why cerebral cortex is important for this neuronal group? What in what way cerebral cortex has a role in control of respiration? When you see something frightening, what happens to your respiration? You can regulate and hyper, respond to the. Do you increase your respiration or do you decrease your respiratory rate? In your care, in your mind. Increase, isn't it? Increase. Ah. So, how is that controlled? The sense of fear is at pursued by the cerebral cortex, isn't it? And from there, you have the connections to the respiratory center situated downwards in the medulla and pons. And so, there are connections to all these three areas. So, what is the role of each of these parts in regulation of respiration? That is the cerebral cortex, the medulla, and pons. What is the role of individual individually by these three components of the nervous system? Okay, the cerebral cortex is responsible for voluntary control of breathing, whereas the medulla and pons are responsible for automatic breathing okay so the medullary and pons centers they only control the automaticity of the respiration but respiration unlike your cardiovascular function or your heart function is partly volitional if you want to hold your breath you can do that you need not breathe all the time in fact one of the important tests we conduct in the three anesthetic assessment what is that test Breath holding. Huh? Don't you do that breath, breath holding test of the breath? breath? Ah, that is how is it possible? It is possible because of the cerebral cortex control. So if you give your command that I am going to take a deep inspiration and hold my breath and see how long I can hold, that volitional control alone is from the cerebral cortex. All the other regular respiration of inspiration and expiration, which we do any number of times every day without our knowledge. Why I say without our knowledge? Do you normally feel that you are breathing? Are you every minute or every second, are you sensing that you are breathing in and breathing out? Are you experiencing that? No, sir. No. But when you experience that, what do you call that? When you feel Taki. that you are taking an inspiration and you are breathing out with difficulty, what do you call that? Gasping. Dyspnea, simple thing. Eh? Unpleasant awareness of one's own sensation of breathing is dyspnea. Whereas normally, we are breathing so many times per day, but we don't feel that at all. So, unpleasant awareness of one's own respiration or breathing is called dyspnea. It's not gasping. Okay? The correct word is dyspnea. Yes. So, that automaticity is controlled by your medulla and pons. Whereas, the volitional control is by cerebral cortex. How long can one hold the breath? Maximum 30 seconds. 30 to 40. Maximum 30 seconds. One minute. Supposing you tell a yogi who practices yoga, how long can he hold his breath? Minutes, five minutes. He can hold it even up to three minutes, four minutes. Yes. But for assessing a patient's cardiorespiratory reserve, what is the minimum amount of time a patient should be able to hold his breath? Minimum time. 20 seconds. 20 to 40 ah, seconds. Minimum 20 seconds. 
okay minimum 20 seconds the patient is able to hold his breath without doing an inspiration or expiration that is considered as a safe level of cardio respiratory reserve okay so this is a very important point that we should know from the regulation of control of respiration that volitional control why after a particular time we are not able to hold the breath even if we want to hold the breath why if we try if we, even if you practice yoga after beyond the particular time you are not able to hold the breath why see what the bills are that very good uh, it so stimulates the center excellent so it is the accumulation of carbon dioxide but why you are not suffering from hypoxia when you hold the breath you are only your co2 goes on accumulating but how does the tissues get oxygenated how do they receive their oxygen due to reserve capacity huh due to residual residual okay. capacity ah functional residual capacity excellent so you have a storage there so that capacity to hold or have some air left in the lung even after your expiration that is the one which is going to supply the oxygen for the time duration you hold your breath but co2 cannot be eliminated when you hold the breath so it starts Stimulating which part of the brain? Which part of the respiratory center? Cortex. To stimulate the expiratory center, to because CO two has to go, so you will start breathing out because you are holding the breath now. There is no inspiration, but the CO two will stimulate the expiratory center for you to go out and. To produce a big exhalation so that all the CO2 will be washed out in one atom. That is what will happen. So, describe how these centers maintain respiration. The next question. So, the nerve impulses arising from the respiratory neurons in these areas regulate the activity of respiratory muscles directly by activating motor neurons in the cervical and thoracic spinal cord that innervate the respiratory muscles. Therefore, the rate and depth of breathing is controlled by the input from these areas, that is, these respiratory centers. And the physical changes in the lungs are then sensed by the mechanoreceptors. There is a stretching of the alveoli, the air passages. All these things produce a mechanical change. So, there are receptors which are called mechanoreceptors, which, uh, and there are peripheral and central chemoreceptors which sense the changes in the carbon dioxide and oxygen level to further adjust the breathing. So, two things are important. One is the mechanoreceptors which sense the changes in the dimensions of the respiratory passages. The second thing is the chemoreceptors which are which judge the level of O2 and CO2. Both of them put together, they make the contribution in control of respiration. Now, how is this control of respiration from the higher brain center, that is cerebral cortex done? What is the connection between cerebral cortex and the lower down situated respiratory centers in the pons and medulla? What is the communication between these two? So, this is for voluntary control as I told earlier. So, the primary motor cortex in the cerebral cortex, we have a motor cortex and the sensory cortex. It is responsible for initiating any voluntary muscular movement, including that of respiration that is the diaphragm. So, the function is achieved through the signals that are sent to the spinal cord via corticospinal tracts and subsequently to the diaphragm. Because diaphragm is the main muscle of respiration. And how is the diaphragmatic activity controlled by is what is the nature of the diaphragm or the uh, uh, constitution of the diaphragm? How it is possible that we are able to prevent its contraction and hold our breath? 
but creating a negative instead of a situation here. Yeah. So for that diaphragm should combine with both voluntary and involuntary muscles, isn't it? So yes, sir. Yes, sir. All the vascular muscles, vasculature muscles, cardiac muscles, they are all voluntary or involuntary muscles? Involuntary. Involuntary, involuntary muscles. But diaphragm is a peculiar organ in our body which is composed of both voluntary or the striated as well as smooth muscles. So the smooth muscle part obeys the commands from the automaticity for the respiratory, inspiratory and expiratory center. There is a striated muscle combination is under our volitional control. That is how we are able to hold the breath. So the cerebral cortex supplies the innervation to the voluntary or striated muscles of the diaphragm through the spinal cord via the corticospinal tract. And that is why when we want to hold our breath, at, a, at our own will and volition, we are able to do that. This is a very important point we have to understand in the control of respiration. So the cortex contains pathways that bypass medullary neurons. Okay, so that is how it is able to, we are, whenever we want to hold our breath, we are able to do it because this spinal, corticospinal tract supplying from the cortical motor centers they bypass the medullary neurons and go directly to the spinal cord and supply the necessary innervation, innervation for diaphragm. Now, why voluntary control of respiration is not possible indefinitely? You have answered already. Voluntary control of respiration, such as the breath holding, cannot occur indefinitely because the chemoreceptor stimulation by hypoxemia or hypercapnia overrides voluntary control. So it is uh, more by hypox hypercapnia rather than by hypoxia. Hypox. So the hypercapnic stimulus is more stronger compared to hypoxic stimulus. Now, what is breaking point? It is pertaining to the same this part of this question. The point beyond it. which the inspiration cannot be occurred. Ah, uh, you cannot hold the breath. The point at which inhibition of breathing can no longer voluntarily occur is called the breaking point. So the maximum duration up to which we can hold the breath is called the breaking point, which is we test in our pre anesthetic assessment. So where are the respiratory control centers situated? Of course, this we have already seen. There are four main anatomical areas and they are called dorsal respiratory group and ventral respiratory group which are situated in the medulla. Then the apneistic and pneumotaxic center which are located in the pons, they are collectively called the pontine respiratory group. So the neurons are collectively present in the both medulla and pons the pond, there are two centers called apneistic and pneumotaxic, whereas the inspiratory and the respiratory, expiratory centers are situated in the VRG and VRG groups in the medulla. So, what is the role of medullary respiratory center? Uh, can regulate the pH. Uh, uh, there only your inspiratory and expiratory centers are situated. So, they only <laughs> initiate the Respiration. The medullary centers composed of two groups of neurons that are concerned with two anatomical areas. One is the inspiratory center, which is the neurons under the group called dorsal respiratory group. And the expiratory center is in the ventral respiratory group of both are situated in the medulla. And the dorsal respiratory group is located next to the nucleus tractus solitarius near the root of cranial nerve 9. So it has sensory afferents from this peripheral chemoreceptors via glossopharyngeal nerve and vagus nerve. So this is the communication. How the uh, level of carbon dioxide in your blood or the oxygen in the blood is conveyed to the 
uh, inspiratory center is by this nerve glossopharyngeal and vagus nerve they only carry that information about the uh, chemoreceptor uh, sensing of the oxygen and carbon dioxide level then motor output is sent to the diaphragm via the phrenic nerve okay so the phrenic nerve is the one which is supplying the motor uh, innervation to the diaphragm so this is the main muscle of respiration and the group of neurons primarily control the timing of respiratory cycle so this drg and vrg which located in the medulla they are the main control centers for our rhythmic respiration and the drg functions in both quiet and forced respiration whether you breathe normally without being aware of it or when you want to do a study or when you want to do a testing and you do a forced respiration both are controlled by this drg and they contain neurons that control lower motor neurons innervating the external intercostal muscles and the diaphragm so even the intercostal muscles are secondary to diaphragmatic activity diaphragm is the main muscle of respiration whereas the ventral root or ventral respiratory group the network of neurons located ventrally in the brain stem extending from spinal cord to the pons medulla junction so that is where they are situated and the vrg respiratory centers primarily responsible for expiration so drg is a inspiratory center vrg is the expiratory center so their rhythmic activity you take an inspiration then it is cut short then expiration is starting and the neurons innervate the lower motor neurons controlling accessory respiratory muscles involved in the active expiration so the for inspiration we require the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles whereas for expiration we require accessory respiratory muscles mainly the uh, sternocleidomastoid the other uh, Muscle situated in the chest wall, abdominal rectus, all these things, they simply retract back to their normal level. So exhalation is a passive process, whereas inspiration or inhalation is an active process. Now, what are the muscles innervated by the neurons of ventral respiratory group? internal intercostal and so the external uh, expiratory muscles muscles okay so it neurons innervate accessory respiratory muscles involved in the active exhalation we saw in the last uh, slide itself the answer is there so are these neurons active during quiet breathing no sir so no active. ventral ah. is not during yeah, quiet breathing expiration occurs passively yes expiration is normally a passive process so only during and they are inactive during quiet breathing okay this is why i told you it is a passive process so normally if you find the accessory yeah. respiratory muscle acting then the respiration is strained so what is the arrangement between the neurons of the drg and vrg how they are arranged one is in the dorsal or another is in the ventral location wise but is there any other uh, communication or any more to find out or do this rhythmic change from inspiration to expiration so the answer for that there is reciprocal inhibition between the neurons involved with the inhalation and exhalation meaning that when inspiratory neurons are active expiratory neurons are inhibited and it would be the reverse when expiratory neurons are active inspiratory neurons they do not discharge or do pass any electrical impulses so there is a reciprocal inhibition so what is the role of spontaneous respiratory group that is the apneistic center and pneumotaxic center what is their role they trigger the actors hmm. trigger for the okay So the apneistic and pneumotaxic centers are responsible for modification of the rhythmic discharge from the medullary neurons. 
otherwise what will happen it will be like a pendulum of the clock going from one to another but if you want to modify that you require the help of apnea stick and pneumotaxic center they regulate the depth and rate of respiration okay in a normal quiet breathing only the inspiratory center that is the drg and the expiratory center drg they are active but when you are uh, doing an exercise or when you are frightened when you want to get a deep inspiration and increase the respiratory rate all that regulation is done by the sensory stimuli or input from other centers of the brain and an increase in pneumotaxic output increases the rate of respiration Okay, the pneumotaxic center output increases the rate of respiration by shortening the duration of each respiration. Whereas a decrease in pneumotaxic center output reduces the respiratory rate but increases the depth of respiration because the apneustic centers will be more active in that instance. So here also there is some intercommunication between these two groups, that is apneustic and pneumotaxic center. So pneumotaxic mainly controls the rate, whereas the apneustic center helps in increasing the depth of respiration. What do you call an increase in the rate of respiration? What is the myth? Tachypnea. What do you call increase in the depth of respiration? Hyperventilation. Hyperpnea. What is hyperventilation? Hyper He said increase in, in rate, hyperpnea is, increase in depth. What do you mean by hyperventilation? We use both this increase in the often. rate and the depth. Yes, sir. Both increase in rate and depth. Yes, sir. So, any other thing can be added to this answer? Sometimes examiners ask you in all these things. If you get a respiratory system case in the practical exam. Increase often out of carbon dioxide. Ah, it should result in some amount of reduction of CO2 also. So hyperventilation means increase in both the rate and depth of respiration, resulting in decrease in carbon dioxide level in the blood. Sometimes, whenever we want to reduce the CO2 in a patient with severe acidosis, what we do? We hyperventilate. We increase the rate as well as the tidal volume and try to wash out the carbon dioxide. Okay. One of the methods of doing it. Whenever in neuroanesthesia, when you want to reduce the brain swelling, the surgeon is doing a craniotomy. What do you do? You hyperventilate purposely for a few minutes, reduce the CO2 level by increasing the rate and depth. That is called hyperventilation. What will you call a normal respiration? A smooth, quiet inspiration and inspiration. Expiration. What is the term to be used for a normal quiet respiration? It's called eupnea, just like your euthyroid. Okay? It's yes, sir. U, u glycemic. Anything u means normal, smooth. Eupnea is the term for normal respiration. What is the term for decreased respiratory rate? Bradypnea. Like, ah, bradypnea. Just like bradycardia, it is bradypnea. So, all these terminologies you should be aware of. Normal respiration is eupnea, increase in rate, tachypnea, increase in depth, hyperpnea, increase in uh, both rate and uh, depth, hyperventilation, decrease in rate, bradypnea. And what is platypnea? Where do you get that word platypnea? We all Normal heard of the word. Or... It's in cardiovascular, <laughs> autoclave, ah, In which condition you will get this terminology being used, platypnea? In which type of patients? Homework. Next class, you must tell me the answer. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, During forced breathing, the apneustic centers respond to sensory input from the vagus nerve regarding the amount of lung inflation 
and prevent over expansion of the lungs by modifying the dorsal respiratory tube so the apneustic center also not only increases the depth but also modifies the uh, prevents the over stretching of the lungs what are afferent inputs to the respiratory center we saw that the respiration neuronal feedback loop is from the sensors to the center then the effectors something like afferent center and different of a reflector so what are all the afferent inputs which can affect the respiratory center this is a very important point major inputs are the chemo chemo receptors from the chemical control as well as non chemical outputs like this so increase in arterial pseo2 increase pseo2 increases the ph in cerebrospinal fluid the mechanism how it is causing this problem or changes the central chemo receptors in medulla respond to hydrogen ions in the cusf and mediate 70% of the carbon dioxide response and the peripheral chemo receptors in the carotid body and aortic bodies mediate 30% of co2 response so this point we have to all of us to know so it is the central chemo receptors which are very important for so patients who have a neural pathology like a head injury or a tumor all these things this mechanism will be affected that is why they have different patterns of respiration in head injury patients so medullary respiratory centers are affected respiratory muscles are stimulated there is an increased ventilation whenever the cao2 increases the automatic mechanism is to increase the respiration both rate and depth and try to revert back and co2 and th2 normal so this is the normal adaptive mechanism that is happening so what are the types of respiratory chemo receptors of course you have the answer here one is the peripheral another is the central chemo receptors so where are the peripheral chemo receptors situated and how do they function of course this slide has already shown you it is also termed the arterial chemo receptors located in the carotid artery in the bifurcation as well as in the aortic body aortic so the other name for peripheral chemo receptors are arterial because situated in the carotid artery, artery. and the aortic so that is why they are also called arterial chemo receptors so the afferent impulses from this carotid body are carried via glossopharyngeal nerve and those from the aortic bodies via the vagus nerve so earlier we saw how they communicate the nucleus tractus solitarius of these two nerves glossopharyngeal and vagus is situated close to the dorsal root group dorsal respiratory group so there is an intercommunication that is how the message is transferred now the aortic and carotid bodies are the only chemo receptors in the body that respond to hypoxemia also uh, but whereas the central chemo receptors they respond only to carbon dioxide so hypoxemia is sensed only by the peripheral aortic and carotid body where are the central chemo receptors situated and what stimulates them and of course the answer is here in the slide by medulla pons in the cord ah uh, the central chemo receptors situated in the medulla on the ventral surface separately from the ventral respiratory group that is a very important point these receptors are not merged or not a part of the ventral respiratory group they are a separate group of neurons situated in the ventral surface of the medulla and central chemo receptors are stimulated by a drop in cerebrospinal fluid ph so whenever the ph will drip down to acidotic side then these stimulators the uh, receptors will be stimulated now this is the mechanism which we saw in the earlier slide carbon dioxide diffuses into the blood to the csf and the area surrounding the central chemo receptors and they react with water 
then catalyzed by carbonic anhydrase, break one down into hydrogen ion and bicarbonate. So then hydrogen diffuses into the chemoreceptor tissue, stimulating the chemoreceptors to activate the respiratory center, thereby increasing the respiratory rate. Now, what is non-chemical control of respiration? How is it done? This is chemical, what we saw by the changes in the CO2 mainly and to some extent by hypoxemia is the chemical control of respiration. Now, is the only method of uh, respiratory control is by chemical? No, so there is non-chemical control also is there. So, how is that done? Mechanoreceptors, stretch receptors. Ah, it is done by mechanoreceptors and muscle spindles, excellent. And mechanoreceptors stimulate the respiratory center through the lung stretch receptors and muscle spindles. Okay. So the lung stretch receptors are located in the bronchial smooth muscle and they stimulate, they are stimulated by overinflation of the lung. So the neural impulse from these receptors travel to the apneustic center via the vagus nerve and results in a reduction in the depth of breathing. So the amnestic center we saw earlier in the pneumotaxic center is responsible for what? Controlling uh, inspiratory, expiratory. Sir. Rate. Uh, rate. The rate and the rate. depth of respiration. Uh, no, depth is by apneustic. Read it carefully. The neural impulse from these receptors, that is, go to the apneustic center via the vagus nerve resulting in reduction in the depth of breathing. So apneustic for depth Hemotaxic for weight. Please yeah. remember that. So this reflex is only called the herring brewer inflation reflex. That is when the lung stretches, the mechanical receptors stimulated carry the sensation via vagus to the apneustic center, which immediately cuts down the further stretch and prevents any rupture of the lung and causing any barotrauma. So the herring brewer inflation reflex occurs when steady lung inflation results in an increase in the duration of expiration, whereas a decrease in the duration of expiration as a result of marked lung deflation is called the herring brewer deflation reflex. So both during inflation and deflation it is very important. The muscle spindles, what do they do? During exercise, there is a change in respiration and this change is initiated mainly by muscle spindle. And impulses generated from the apparent pathways of proprioreceptors located in the muscles, tendons and joints stimulate inspiratory neurons during exercise and they in turn stimulate the respiratory center to increase the respiratory rate to help clear the carbon dioxide and as it produced by exercise and also increase the oxygen supply to the tissues. So the muscle spindles play a very important role, not that much during quiet normal breathing, but more during exercise or when you do any strenuous activity where you have to uh, increase your oxygen intake as well as clear the CO2 that is produced. So basically, now you have seen there are two types of regulation. One is the chemical regulation. The second is the non-chemical or neuronal regulation of respiration. So by learning like this, splitting the answers, now you can join all these points when you have to write a theory question. You have to. So it, by understanding this, you need not um, by heart anything. You can. Simply go recollect all these things and write your answers in a paragraph uh, way so that you can uh, furnish a decent answer for this question. So, what are irritant receptors and what is their role? So, what we have seen so far is a normal respiration. How a normal inspiration and expiration takes place, we have seen that. But what are the irritant receptors and what is their role? Uh -huh. Uh, cough reflex, like they protect the airways mm. in response to uh, smell and uh, dust and other mm. chemicals. Mm. When it comes in contact with the mucosa, it will uh, increase the Trigger. secretion and uh, mm. ciliary activities. 
So these are located in the airway epithelium. So where is, where these receptors are located? They are mainly located in the airway epithelium. That is the passage through which the air has to travel and reach the ultimately the alveoli. And they cause bronchoconstriction and stimulate ventilation as a protective mechanism in response to inhalation of any noxious agents, whether it may be a gas or a particle, whatever it is. And chemicals such as histamine stimulate these receptors, activating rapidly adapting receptors in the trachea, causing coughing, bronchoconstriction, and secretion of mucus. Okay. So whatever you have answered is more or less correct. What are extra capillary receptors or J receptors and what is their function? Just like in kidney, you talk about extra medullary apparatus. It is extra capillary. Extra means by the side or by the close proximity of a capillary. So these receptors are non-myelinated T fibers in the alveolar walls located in close proximity to pulmonary vessels. Hence, they are named dextra capillary receptors. So they are different types of nerve fibers, non-myelinated T fibers, which are situated in the alveolar walls. And they are activated by hyperinflation of the lung or by dyspnea or by bradycardia or by hypotension. So these are the things which stimulate this particular just a capillary receptors, either hyperinflation of the lung. That is why, what do you call an emphysema test patient? Hyperinflated. Uh... Pink puffers. Pink puffers. Pink puffers is the person with uh, bronchitis, Chronic we bronchitis. call them as blue bloaters. Whereas person with emphysema, we call them as pink puffers. Pink puffers. So why do they puff, go on uh, breathing heavily puff, puff like that? Because there is a hyperinflation of the lung. And which receptor is responsible for that? Is the gesta capillary or A receptor. And patients who become dyspneic, there also this particular receptor is very important for that particular dyspneic uh, episode. In bradycardia, whenever a patient uh, goes in for decrease in heart rate, this will be stimulated. And hypotension also will stimulate this gesta capillary receptor. In intravenous or intracardiac administration of capsaicin leads to activation of J receptors, producing a reflex response termed pulmonary chemoreflex, which is a new terminology not given in many textbooks. So you have to know, just know this for additional marks or if some intelligent examiners ask about all these things, you can just answer. So it's called pulmonary direct chemoreflex. It is characterized by apnea followed by rapid breathing, bradycardia, and hypotension. So, if a drug called capsaicin is intravenously administered, it can directly stimulate J receptor. But otherwise, normally hyperinflation, as in emphysema or dyspnea, due to any reason, bradycardia and hypotension, all these things will stimulate this. J receptors, which are non myelinated C fibers situated in the walls of the alveoli. And this response is similar to the basal jarish reflex produced by receptors in the heart. What is this basal jarish reflex? When will you get it? Uh, during insult to the cardiac muscles. Sir. Like what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, yeah myocardial infarction. A cardiac infarction, or when you do a, sometimes you know when you do a, a correct a coronary angiogram, when you pass a guide wire, the direct touch yes. of the in very unfortunate sometimes this can happen. It is also called the basal jarish reflex, which is a direct stimulation of the ventricular muscles. So although the physiological role of pulmonary chemoreflex is unclear, 
is believed to occur in pathologic states such as pulmonary congestion or embolism. What are pain receptors and what is their role in control of respiration or section of respiration? In response to pain, uh, the rate and the depth of respiration will increase. Uh, there are yes, the ventilation is stimulated by activation of pain receptors. And hyperventilation during acute pain has been proposed to reflect the respiratory component of the flight or fight response fight. because of the sympathetic stimulation, preparing the body for possible attack or injury. Okay? So you would have seen any patients in acute pain due to trauma, they will all be hyperventilated. They will increase the rate. At least they will be tachypneic. Even though they may not hyperventilate and all the time, they will be definitely tachypneic because the ventilation is stimulated from the pain centers. Then another important thing we have to know is about the bronchomotor tone. So earlier, the answers which we saw all this thing is now mainly about the control of respiration. So how normal mechanism of control of respiration occurs both due to chemoreflexes as well as neuronal control and what are all the irritant reflexes and pain reflex and their communication we saw. So that much of answer is enough for physiology of control of respiration. Another important thing which all of us as anesthesiologists because we meddle with the airway. We sometimes intubate, we put the bronchoscope, we so the uh, instrumentation of the airway is done by us. So we must know something about the bronchomotor tone, which can result in bronchoconstriction, which is called the wheezing or the airway obstruction. So what is bronchomotor tone and what factors influence them? Neuronal regulations. Hmm. The state of contraction or relaxation of the smooth muscles in the bronchial walls that regulates the caliber of the airway. So bronchomotor tone is nothing but it can be a contraction or a relaxation of the smooth muscles situated in the bronchial walls that regulates the caliber of the airways. It can either uh, make a narrowing or it can dilate. So all these things are are done by the bronchomotor tone. So number of factors influences the change of bronchomotor tone. Example, depth of anesthesia. So deeper anesthesia will produce dilatation or constriction? Dilatation. Hey? Dilatation. Dilatation. So one of the Advice is given whenever a patient develops a bronchospasm intraoperatively is to deepen the plane of anesthesia because lighter plane of anesthesia stimulates the smooth muscles and produces a constriction. So if you deepen the plane of anesthesia, these smooth muscles will relax and that will dilate the airway and relieve the obstruction or the uh, bronchoconstriction. And some drugs can do that and various procedures on airway, they can also alter the bronchomotor tone, respiratory diseases, bronchial asthma, and inhalation agents, all these things can uh, produce a problem. So, how is the smooth muscle contraction caused? What is the mechanism by which the smooth muscles, not only at the respiratory tract level, but anywhere in the body, what is the mechanism by which smooth muscle contraction occurs? Which ion is very important for smooth muscle contraction? Calcium. 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 Ah, unlike your sodium and potassium exchange in all other cell membranes, it is the calcium which is very, very important for smooth muscle contraction. Please remember that point. So, smooth muscle contraction depends on calcium influx, that is, entry of calcium into the smooth muscle cell. So calcium increases within the smooth muscle cell through two different processes. What are the two different processes? So calcium should be increasing inside the smooth muscle cell, the cytoplasm. 
what are the methods by which this calcium can enter because calcium is it may uh, extra extracellular ion or an intracellular ion extracellular extracellular namely that is why it has to enter cell and then potassium and magnesium are the major intracellular ion sodium and calcium are major extracellular ion so the extracellular calcium has to enter the smooth muscle cytoplasm to initiate further activity to make it contract so what are the routes by which the calcium can enter which is because basically it is a extracellular ion it has to enter into the cell cell of the smooth muscle what are the parts of the calcium channels ah what channel there are different types of calcium channels oh, l type calcium l type excellent 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 l type calcium channel very good then what is the other mechanism we have asked two different processes Um, other is from the endoplasmic reticulum, sir. Calcium, ah, calcium, calcium induced calcium release. Okay, please remember this is a very basic biochemistry answer which all of you have to know. Cell physiology. Okay, the first is by depolarization hormones or neurotransmitters cause calcium to enter cell through L-type channels located in the cell membrane. Okay, so all cells, even your uh, regular uh, Dieted muscles also have the same thing. So L-type calcium channels allow the extracellular calcium to enter into the cytoplasm of the smooth muscle. That is the first process. The second process is intracellularly there is a storage of calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this is a bag which contains calcium. And once the extracellular calcium enters through the L-type channel. This calcium will cause a release of the stored calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm, and this is called the calcium-induced calcium release. Okay, so this is the second mechanism by which intracellular calcium levels go up. What happens after the level of the calcium goes up, which is normally an extracellular ion, it has now entered the uh, cytoplasm of the smooth muscle. So the level of calcium has gone up in the cytoplasm of the smooth muscle. Then what happens? It what initiates action potentials. Very good. Ah. So steps involved in the smooth muscle cell contraction. So first thing, basically, all of you have to know is it is the calcium which is responsible for the muscle contraction, whether it is smooth muscle or striated muscle, because it is a bronchomotor. We are discussing about smooth muscle. The same process is for striated muscles also. So the first thing is depolarization of the membrane, or by hormone or neurotransmitter activation. L-type voltage gated channels open. Calcium enters into the cytoplasm. This calcium causes release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So there is an increase in the total intracellular calcium level. Then the calcium binds with a uh, component called call modulate. Call modulate. This is the one which modulates the calcium. So this is cal for calcium. Modulin is a modulator. So it's called a protein called modulin, which stimulates what is called myosin light chain kinase. This is an enzyme which is activated, and uh, a phosphate group will be attached to this myosin light chain. And this will result in increase in myosin ATPase activity, and this will cause myosin P to bind with the actin, and there will be actin myosin coupling will happen or uh, bridging will happen and lead to increase in muscle tone. So the final step is to make the actin myosin complex shorten so that the muscle becomes short and increase in tone. So, first point is entry of calcium. Second point is increase in the intracellular calcium level by release from the star. Then activation of myosin light chain light chain kinases. Then active phosphorylation of this myosin light chain. 
So this myosin and actin have to ultimately bind together to form the root muscle contraction or the side head muscle. These are all the basic steps that all of us should know so that we can break this at any level to pass a decrease. So this is a pictorial description of the same thing. So calcium enters through the L type channel, then it is causing uh, the release from the entire uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum, then binds with that, activates this, then final step is myosin actin coupling or contraction. So this is what results in contraction. Once you again break this coupling and release and separate myosin with actin, then it will be uh, go back to the original relaxed state. And that is caused by nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a smooth muscle relaxant. It interferes with the uh, gonadine triphosphate, preventing it to getting converted into cyclic GMP. And cyclic GMP normally activates this, which is prevented. So myosin actin complex is prevention is formed. So relaxation occurs. So these are the same things which are given in the first form. Now, how nervous and paracrine control of airway smooth muscle contraction happens? Normally, airway smooth muscles are, can be, as we saw earlier, things which can affect the bronchomotor tone. So there is a nervous control as well as a paracrine control for smooth muscle contraction. How it is... Uh, uh, Adrenergic and the cholinergic yeah. receptors present. Ah, very good. Nervous is either from parasympathetic or sympathetic and paracrine. So, parasympathetic nervous system is a major bronchoconstrictor neural pathway of the airways. And cholinergic innervation is responsible for airway basal tone. Okay, So, this is the basal uh, so point which a nervous control exhibits. And the cholinergic fibers travel down the vagus nerve, main nerve of uh, the supplying the lung and uh, the bronchomotor areas in the air passages is vagus, which is a parasympathetic ganglia within the airway wall. And parasympathetic ganglia density is maximal in the proximal airways, around the fifth to seventh bronchial generations. How many generations are there? The 23. 23. 23. 23. And who classified them? Weeble. 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 Very good. Weeble classified. And how they are, how these generations are classified? Up to 17. One to 16 is conducting. Yes. So that we will be reading when we talk about the anatomy. Okay. So up to 17th generation, it is mainly a conductor. It's the passage for the air to travel. From 17 to 20 or 21, sometimes it's called transition zone, where both passage as well as some amount of exchange of gases happen. From 21 to 23, it is purely exchange zone, where the uh, uptake of oxygen and removal of carbon dioxide happens. So from these ganglia, short post synaptic fibers reach smooth muscles and the glands. And acetylcholine is the main neurotransmitter of the parasympathetic nervous system. And it released both at the ganglionic level and post-ganglionic junction. So yeah, acetylcholine is the main transmitter, both levels in parasympathetic. Whereas in sympathetic at the ganglion level, it is acetylcholine at the post-ganglionic level. For sympathetic, which is the transmitter? Uh, Noradrenaline. Yes, very good. That is the basic autonomic physiology. So, what causes bronchial relaxation? What we saw earlier was stimulation of parasympathetic will lead only to bronchoconstriction. So, adrenergic stimulation relaxes the airway. And beta 2 adrenoreceptors are largely expressed in airway smooth muscle. So, stimulation of the beta 2 adrenoreceptors causes a bronchial relaxation. Thus, non adrenergic, non cholinergic parts of the autonomic nervous system have any effect on bronchomotor tone? 
So normally we classify the autonomic nervous system into sympathetic and parasympathetic. Now there is a third group which is also described in the books which is called non-polynergic, non-adrenergic part of the parasympathetic, I mean autonomic nervous system. So NANC as they are called. So the NANC component of autonomic nervous system can release other contracting or relaxant agonists such as neuropeptide Y, substance P, ATP and neurokinin and vasoactive intestinal peptides which are all the transmitter substances for this particular system. Because there is no acetylcholine and there is no noradrenaline, they are called non-adrenergic, non-cholinergenic components. And their transmitters are these substances and some of them they can cause contraction and some of them can cause relaxation of the bronchial smooth muscles. So this system is not well developed in human airways but has a small regulatory effect on human airway function. What other factors can influence bronchomotor tone? So mainly parasympathetic constriction, sympathetic relaxation. Very, very smooth, a small percentage, either constriction or relaxation by NANC receptors or the neurons. Apart from these three types, are there any other factors which can influence bronchomotor tone? Leukotrienes. Very good. Uh, in addition to that, airways such as epithelial cell, inflammatory cells, myocytes can release variety of mediators called histamine, endothelin, ATP, and mediators of arachinoidic acid, which is called leukotrienes. Also, modulate airway contraction via specific membrane receptors. Okay? So they are called non Adrenergic, non cholinergic, non uh, three uh, autonomic nervous system. Apart from that, these are the locally secreted transmitters which also can produce. That is why in anaphylactic shock, it is not the parasympathetic or it is the sympathetic, but it is the histamine release from the mast cell and the endothelin release or ATP release or metabolites of arachidonic acid can modulate airway contraction via yeah, specific membrane receptors. Now coming to the central control sometimes, does thalamus have a role in respiration? They regulate only the upfront and upfront signals. But... Mm. Stimulated by increasing core temperature because thalamus is the controlling center for our body temperature. So, you would have seen whenever a person develops thyroxia or fever, automatically the respiratory rate goes up because the body's oxygen demand goes up. That is the reason why patients become tachypneic when they have thyroxia. So, that and that this is an abnormal, this is not a normal physiological control, but during pathological stage, when a patient develops thyroxia, the thalamus is the one which stimulates the respiratory center to increase the respiratory rate. So, what is the connection of limbic system to respiration? Okay. The pain and emotional stimuli result in hyperventilation, suggests that afferents from the limbic system and hypothalamus send signals to the respiratory neurons in the brainstem. Mm -hmm. So this is how the whole thing, the thalamus is situated. Then the normal control is by CSF chemoreceptors and the neuronal receptors. So this is the entire pathway, how they are all connected with each other. And uh, the regulation of respiration in a simple fashion, it is the sensor which acts on the central controller and affects us. So this diagram, if you remember, it is easy for you to answer in the examination. So the sensors are chemoreceptors, central and peripheral, pulmonary receptors and other receptors. Central control at the brainstem, pons, medulla, cortex and the, of course this uh, limbic system and thalamus have got a part in the uh, 
physiological state, not in normal physiological state. And the output from structures like respiratory muscles, diaphragm, abdominal muscles, accessory muscles. So I just put this diagram for you to remember easily so that you can elaborate on this and write your answers on control of respiration. Now, why should we know about the effects of transactions on breathing patterns? For example, the question is, supposing a patient comes with a brainstem injury due to trauma and there is a transaction of the brainstem at this level, upper part of the pons, or there is a transaction at the middle of the pons. Another patient, it is below the pons, but at the level of upper medulla. And then the another patient, it is at the uh, spinal cord level below the medulla. So if there is an injury causing transactions at these levels, what will be the pattern of breathing? Any idea? At level when voluntary control is lost. Uh, so that the normal level with a decrease in frequency and tidal volume. If the vagus is intact, if there is no injury to the vagus nerve, the level will be breathing. It is proportion where there is a, a transaction at the proximal pons level. And so both of them depend on the integrity of the vagus nerve. So if the vagus is intact, then the breathing will be normal when there is a transaction at level one. But if the vagus nerve is injured, then there will be a bradypnea, decrease in frequency, but the tidal volume will be slightly increased because of the bradypnea. And if it is in the middle of the palm, and if the vagus is increased, there is a decrease in frequency, mm. which is similar to this, but increase in uh, tidal volume. But if the vagus is also injured, then patient goes in for what is called apneustic type of breathing. There is no regular pattern, there will be a sudden prolonged expiration followed by expiration, which is called apneistic type of breathing. And in the third level, it will be gasping like breathing if the vagus is intact. And if the vagus is cut, then it will be uh, intermittent gasping. So if the continuous gasping, it will be intermittent gasping, the vagus is not intact. And the last level where there is a transaction below the medulla but above the spinal cord there will be no respiration at all because all the, uh, the communication to the muscles of respiration are totally lost so patient will have no neuronal stimulation and even your stimulation of co2 cannot stimulate and because there is a no nervous control patient will be totally happy so this is what you can identify in an emergency room, when you get a <coughs> head injury patient with a brainstem injury, uh, this knowledge of the various patterns of respiration will be helping you to identify at what possible level the injury could have happened. <coughs> now the next part of our knowledge should be about respiratory mechanics and what is its application to <coughs> anesthesia. What do you understand by that word respiratory mechanics? Any idea? When we breathe in, what happens? We take a respiration, inspiration, what happens? The lung and the chest wall expands and the diaphragm contracts and goes below. Uh, to increase the thoracic uh, Space, isn't it? So, how, yes, what are what are the things which control that expansion? Stretch it. I cannot stretch the So, the correct terminology we have to use is air flow resistance and compliance. That is what is the components of respiratory mechanics. So, the normal layman's description of inspiration we take in a certain volume of air from the atmosphere into the lung. For that, the air should be able to travel smoothly down the air passage and reach the balloon-like alveoli at the end for exchange of gases to take place. This is the 
simplest method by which you can describe our inspiratory respiratory activity so for that to happen properly the passage should not cause any resistance to the flow and the lung alveoli should be adaptive enough to stretch and take the air that is being delivered to it so this we call it as airway resistance and compliance and these two are the main things which form the respiratory mechanics so respiratory mechanics refer to the expression of lung function to pressure and flow from these variety of derived indices are determined such as flow pressure volume compliance resistance and work of breathing okay so these are all the things which we have to know in respiratory mechanics why because when you set a ventilator for your patient in icu unless you know what is the basics of respiratory mechanics like what flow should be kept what is the pressure maximum you have to achieve how much volume to deliver what is the compliance state of the uh, alveoli how much resistance is offered by the passage and how much of work of breathing if the patient has to do if he is breathing spontaneously so if you have knowledge about all these things you will be able to adjust your ventilator setting in such a way that your patient will not fight the ventilator rather he will it will mimic his own normal respiration and your ventilator settings will help the patient to achieve the target of adequate oxygenation and removal of carbon dioxide instead of making him struggle with the ventilator that is the main reason why we should know about the respiratory mechanics and its application so how lungs are distended during normal respiration and what is it called <coughs> inspiration so in normal res respiration there is a negative pleural pressure developed which distends the lungs from the inspiratory phase okay so a creation of negative pleural pressure that is very very important because unless you know this normal uh, mechanism by which the lungs are or the alveoli are allowed to distend when you do mechanical ventilation of a patient what what are we converting this into we are converting the positive negative pressure, pressure into totally into positive, positive pressure, pressure both during inspiration and expiration okay that is a major change that we do that is why i have put here in normal respiration negative pleural pressure develop distends the lungs during inspiratory phase distending pressure is also known as the transpulmonary pressure which is expressed by the following equation so how do you calculate the transpulmonary pressure is patient alveolar pressure minus pleural pressure so the pleural cavity has got a negative space a small space which has a negative pressure so the alveolar pressure minus the pleural pressure is what is called the transpulmonary pressure so what is compliance of a lung how do you define is, a compliance change in volume, pressure to change volume, in volume, 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 pressure. Change, volume change in volume to the even change, change in pressure, pressure. very pressure. good that is what is called the compliance that is the lung is adaptable everything of the lung to distend depends on the volume of the lung so compliance is expressed as Distance. the distension of lung for a given level of <coughs> transpulmonary transpulmonary so it, what is the normal value it is about 0.2 to 0.3 liters per centimeters of water so this is the pressure this is the volume so there is a change from normal whatever volume initially is there by 0.2 to 0.3 liters that is 200 to 300 ml for every 1 cm increase in the pressure and compliance is lowest at extremes of functional residual capacity and it is implies that well expanded lung and completely deflated lung they have lower capacity to distend that is why we always have some amount of functional residual capacity present in the alveoli to prevent them from totally collapsing or too much getting expanded 
so that they can easily expand during the next respiration so if they every time if they have to completely collapse and then re expand their work of breathing will be enormously increased patient has to struggle use his muscles to inflate the alveoli every time so that is the reason why the nature has made it in such a way that we always have some amount of air left in the alveoli and keep this alveoli and the air passages partly distended so that it can be easy to inflate them during the next subsequent respiration this intrapleural pressure same at all levels of the lung if you take a person sitting straight up from the apex of the lung to the base of the lung is the intrapleural pressure same everywhere or it is different a difference sir it is slightly different not only really slightly different but uh, remarkably different for that the upright lung intrapleural pressure varies from top to the base of the lung okay this is a very important basic physiology all of us should remember very well so intrapleural pressure becomes 0.2 cm positive for every cm distance from the apex to base of the lung so normally it is negative isn't it but when it comes down from the apex to the base gradually it becomes more and more less negative or becomes more positive so what is the average height of a lung in an average person an adult patient with an average build what is the height of the lung that is when you see in the erect posture from apex to the base what is the value Ar for that huh? this jump something like a it is question. different in anterior and posterior talking about height not the breadth that is the vertical height from the apex to the base is about 35 cm okay so this is the so it is just for the case you participate in some quiz program in any conference then this may come in handy now what is the intrapleural pressure at the apex and base of lung during quiet breathing this is a normal value all of us should know the apex it will be more or less more negative sir hmm in quiet breathing the apex is minus 8 cm of water at the apex base it is only minus 1.5 cm of water okay so apex is minus 8 cm and base is minus 1.5 cm why is this difference what is the reason for this difference to get another homework for you to go and find out the answer next time yeah, the cross section of right. lung is yes, no no guess what you have to give the correct okay, answer sir. <laughs> okay sir so already one one question platypnea is there this is the yes, okay uh, make a note of that and tell me the answer right what is the implication of the difference in pleural pressure Now we saw it is minus eight centimeters at the apex, minus one point five centimeters at the base. So does it have any relevance? There any importance of this? The alveoli in the apex will stress is even more when compared to the base. Hmm. This means the alveoli at the apex are exposed to greater distending okay. pressure compared to those at the base. Okay. so what happens as already distant that apical region becomes less compliant to other areas of the lung so as of the greater distending pressure and already it will be distant at the same extent apex is less compliant compared to the base so whenever you want to improve oxygenation you must aim to ventilate the basal portion more than the apical portion that is why the 
Yeah. That's why in COVID time, all of you would have known, we put the patient in prone ventilation so that the bases are aerated well to improve the oxygenation. Okay? The main idea is to ventilate the basal zones better because they will be more compliant compared to the vertical zones. So this explains the preferential distribution of ventilation at the base of the lung in the upright posture also. So distribution of ventilation changes with the position because of change in the pleural pressure with the gravity. Already the answer is there. So what is closing volume, closing capacity and what is its importance? The volume at which the smaller the airways tends to remain close. Tends to begin to close. To close. Good. So that is the definition. The volume of airway closure during inspiration is a normal phenomena. The reopening of airways during succeeding inspiration. The volume remaining above the residual volume where expiration below FRC closes some airways is termed as closing volume. So the volume remaining which is above residual volume but below FRC when some portions of the airways begin to close that is what is called the closing volume. And this volume added to the residual volume is shown as closing capacity because always capacities are nothing but combination of volume. So the definition of closing volume is the volume of air that is present in the lung which is above the residual volume but below the functional residual volume and it should be there at the time when the small airways begin to close. Not They are not totally closed, they begin to close. So all these terminologies are very important when you write the definition of closing volume. And the capacity is nothing but a combination of this closing volume plus the residual volume with the closing capacity. And what is its importance? That is the second part of this question. So we have defined closing volume. We have defined closing capacity. Now what is the importance of this closing capacity or closing volume? Should it be always lower than FRC or equal to FRC or above FRC? It should be lower than FRC. It should always be below FRC. That is why this definition I have chosen to make it understand why it is important. So whenever the closing capacity or closing volume encroaches upon the FRC or exceeds the FRC, what will happen? Airways have started closing even before you can uh, completely exhale out or inhale. So it can result either in air trapping, trapping. or atelectasis. Both can happen. So if air trapping or atelectasis happens, what will happen to the oxygenation? Decrease. It will decrease. It will impede with the oxygenation. So which means the ventilation is more uh, pre oxygenation. Okay. So, in upright position, normally closing capacity approaches near FRC in older individuals. As age advances, the CC, closing capacity, even by nature, becomes equal or slightly even exceeds FRC as you grow older. And would result in airway closure even at normal tidal expiration. And this, so this is the importance of CC. We must always talk in terms of its relationship with FRC and that is how the closing capacity becomes important. Now, what is FRC and what is its importance? Well, it is important. What is the definition of FRC? It is the combination of functional residual volume and the residual volume. We are not volume asking of lung how you, how you and lung it is the entire complete expiration. Ah, it's awesome. the equilibrium point where the tendency of the lung to collapse and the chest wall to expand is equal. It is the that's how it will happen. But there, what is FRC? The definition is functional residual capacity is the volume remaining in the lung 
after a normal passive exhalation. It is not a forced expiration. It is a normal passive exhalation. When you do that, what is the amount of air that is left in the lungs is what is called the functional residual capacity. And it is a combination of expiratory reserve volume and residual volume. That is how you calculate the capacity. And uh, the FRC is important because it is related to several factors such as airway and vascular resistance, work of breathing, the compliance of the alveoli, oxygen reserve that is required, closing capacity, and weekly mismatch. All these things are related to your FRC. So remember airway and vascular resistance, work of breathing, compliance, oxygen reserve, closing capacity, and DC mismatch are all interrelated to your functional residual capacity. So these are the some volumes and capacities. So a volume is measured directly, whereas a capacity is nothing but a sum of these volumes. All of you, all of you know all these things. So there are four capacities and four volumes. So the four volumes are tidal volume, expiratory reserve volume, residual volume, and the inspiratory reserve volume. So there are reserve volume for inspiration and expiration apart from your normal tidal volume. And there is a residual volume, the amount of air which cannot be expelled out from the lung at any cost. So these four volumes are there. The combination of this makes the capacities. So if you combine inspiratory capacity, that is the tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve volume makes the inspiratory capacity. If you add the expiratory reserve volume, it becomes vital capacity. Why it is called vital capacity? Any idea? Why they have termed this capacity? That is a combination of uh, tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve volume plus expiratory reserve volume. All the three put together, it is called vital capacity. Why they have given that term vital to this capacity? What is it vital? Sir, in cases of emergency intubation, not two vital breaths, three vital breaths is enough to fill the lungs. Mm -hmm. uh, Instead of uh, uh, yes, but the, these terminologies are given by physiologists, not by anesthetists. Oh, okay. okay. Physiology, the Guyton, Hill, Hall, all these people, they oh. are the ones who gave these names. They never thought about anesthesia. They are given it because it is important for some vital function in our body. What is that vital function? The body is responsible for your effective cough. Okay, so whenever anything goes abnormally into your respiratory passages, like a drop of water or a food or any saliva or secretion, what do you do? How do you expel it out? By violent coughing. Okay, so the ability to cough is by this capacity, vital capacity. If it is normal, you will be able to cough. That is why in the Major abdominal or thoracic surgeries, we always do preoperative physiotherapy by incentive spirometry to improve this vital capacity so that patient will be able, be able to cough out secretions postoperatively, especially when you give GA, the patient will be able to cough out any unwanted secretions. Otherwise, they will develop uh, the retained secretions will develop into a mnemonic patch. So post uh, anesthetic uh, pneumonia, uh, the pneumonitis will be very, very common or it can produce atelic cases also. So that is the reason why it is called vital capacity because it is vital for effective cough. So what is the value? Any idea about vital capacity? 4.1. Just always say in terms of ml per kg because it is not the same for every patient. So you must be able to say it in ML AG. So what factors affect the FRC and what happens when FRC decreases? So, so pen position. Uh, age, position, age, height. So you can say it, FRC can increase or decrease because we, uh, we have given and uh, the question is still what happens when FRC decreases. So that means something can increase the FRC also, isn't it? 
So factors can affect so we to, we are, increase FRC, decrease FRC. What factors will increase FRC? You said pre -oxygenate. Adequate pre-oxygenation for the minutes adequate with a hundred percent. Factors causing FRC is increases slightly with age due to loss of elasticity in the connective tissue, which increases the work of breathing. The air becomes harder to expel. And the lungs do not return to normal size mm -hmm. after expiration. So, by age, advanced age, FRC slightly increases factor number one. Second is the person's height. We saw earlier the average length of uh, height of the lung is 35 centimeters. So, if a person is much more taller, he will have a larger lung volume, and so they will have greater FRC. With a budget, is supposed to have a larger FRC because it is very tall. And men tend to have a significantly larger lung volume when compared to women of the same height and weight. So, gender wise, men have slightly increased FRC compared to women. So, three factors which cause increase in FRC are increasing age, increasing height, and male gender. But, majority of the factors they try to decrease the FRC. So, factors causing decrease in FRC are Changes in body position, position. from supine or lateral or even prone reduces FRC and uh, pregnancy, ascites and obesity and general anesthesia, the neonates also have low FRC and surgery, especially in the upper abdominal surgery, they also reduce FRC. So, reduction in FRC promotes airway closure in dependent lung region. So, if you have a normal FRC, the airways remain open till you fully exhale. But if they decrease, airway closure occurs much more faster. So, the GQ mismatching will happen. And now, also, when there is a reduction in FRC, when you induce anesthesia, the patients desaturate faster. So, that is why the pregnant woman desaturates much more faster if you don't pre oxygenate properly. Similarly, patients with ascites and obesity, they also will desaturate. And uh, general anesthesia, because the diaphragm gets moving upwards, causes the splinting of the proper movement of the uh, basal lung portions that also decreases FRC. So, this is a very common question in the examination. What factors reduce the FRC and what is its effect is faster desaturation. So, the mnemonics that you can remember for this is PANGO, pregnancy, ascites, neonate, uh, general anesthesia, obesity, and surgery. If you put all these uh, first letters, you get a mnemonic called PANGO, P A N G O S, PANGO is the mnemonic you can remember for this. And since lung blood flow preferentially goes to dependent region, Matching between ventilation and perfusion is exceeded by decreasing of parts. So, this is what is happening. Now, I am showing you a picture here. So, what, it, what test is being performed and what gas law is employed here? Idea? <clears throat> Person is sitting inside a box. Looks like he's doing a Valsalva maneuver. Valsalva mm -hmm. maneuver. Plethysmography. Ah, this is body plethysmography. Excellent. So, what is this test used for? Why do you want to do body plethysmography? To measure the volume and the FRC. Huh? Yes, by measuring for FRC, you are right. You cannot measure it by other spirometry. Okay? FRC and residual volume, you can measure only by what is called body plethysmography. And which law is employed is it is the voice law. law. Pressure and volume are inversely proportional at a constant temperature. So, in this, what happens? Patient is placed in a closed box with a mouthpiece 
that exists the exit the box. So this is a mouthpiece. This is connected to outside this, and patient is uh, asked to inhale okay, with the uh, mouthpiece being uh, closed with his lips tightly without any gap. He is asked to inhale. So when he inhales the air, what happens? The pressure outside decreases because he is taking part of the gas in that. The volume of gas in the box decreases, and therefore the pressure increases. So the measurement of FRC by body plethysmograph is based on the application of Boyle's law, which is P1 V1 is equal to P2 V2. So volume will be P2 into V2 minus P1. So you know the volume of this box. You know the pressure inside. You know the patient is taking in. So there is a decrease in the alteration in the pressure. So finally you can. Find out the volume by using this simple calculation. So, body plethysmography exam. Sometimes they ask you, how do you measure the FRC? It is by body plethysmography using the Boyle's law. Just for you to remember that easily, I put this picture. What are the causes of impedance to ventilation? So, continuing with our respiratory mechanics, we saw all this now about the compliance and the volume. Now, what causes the impedance to ventilation? Now, it's numerous origins. <clears throat> Most of important are elastic resistance of the lung tissue and chest wall. This is the first and foremost cause for that is, the, in other words, why air is not able to flow freely from the atmosphere towards the alveoli. That is the uh, simple way of expressing impedance to ventilation. So, it is the elastic resistance of lung tissue and chest wall. Resistance from surface forces at the alveolar gas liquid interface, frictional resistance to glass flow through the airways, and frictional resistance from deformation of the thoracic tissues, that is, viscoelastic tissue resistance. Inertia associated with movement of gas and tissues is negligible at the normal respiration. So, there are two, three, four, five factors which cause impedance. The first two forms, that is the elastic resistance of lung tissue and chest wall and the resistance from the surface forces of the alveolar gas interface, these two are termed as elastic resistance or uh, static compliance. So they go on to form what is called static compliance. And that is measured by when the gas flow is not flowing within the lung and represent the total complaints of the lung and chest wall. So the complaints is increase or change in volume to change in pressure. That is the definition of complaints, what we saw. Whereas elastance is increase or change in pressure opposite of complaints. The change in the pressure that happens because of change in volume. So the last three. That is the frictional resistance to gas flow, frictional resistance from thoracic tissues, inertia, all these things are called non elastic resistance. So, earlier it was elastic resistance or static compliance. This is non elastic resistance or respiratory system resistance, which is called as dynamic compliance. So, dynamic compliance occurs when the gas is flowing within the airways. And work performed in overcoming the frictional resistance is dissipated as heat and loss. So, impedance to flow represents the resistance of the airways. So, resistance is nothing but increase or change in pressure to flow. This is what is called the resistance. So, three terminologies you have to remember one is the static compliance, the second is dynamic compliance, and the third is resistance to flow. These are the three important things which are uh, important for impeding or enhancing the ventilation. So, if a lung is good, compliant lung, instead of becoming stiff, then your ventilation will be good. If the frictional forces are not there, then the air will be able to reach the alveoli well. And if there is no resistance offered by the air passages, then your ventilation will be good. So these three things we will be able to measure and then these things can be to some extent altered also. 
that is the reason why we have to know about these things so the factors causing impedance you have to remember static compliance dynamic compliance and air flow resistance now the next important point asked in the examination is dead space what is dead space and what is its importance and how they are measured what is dead space first of all definition no air flow occurs no air exchange does not occur air exchange where the air exchange does not occur volume of air that does not take part in gaseous exchange is called as dead space okay so that is the first definition dead space represents the volume of ventilated air that does not participate in gas exchange that means that air goes in and comes out as is where is condition it goes with the same composition of nitrogen uh, oxygen and uh, your minimal amounts of uh, trace elements or gases and comes back with the same thing there is the, uh, the volume of air that has taken part in the gaseous exchange it will have given up all the oxygen it has taken up carbon dioxide and it will contain more carbon dioxide and less oxygen there is the dead space air that has come out without any participation in gas exchange will be equal to the atmospheric air that you have inhaled it will not have any change in the composition so that is the meaning of dead space the two types of dead space are anatomical, anatomical dead space and physiological together they are called physiological dead space all of you know this point so this is how this anatomic dead space goes out and alveolar dead space where the ventilation is taking place but there is no blood flow to cause the gas exchange so it, it can also be called as wasted ventilation to inflate the alveoli but there is no blood which is coming to take the oxygen and uh, remove the carbon dioxide so that becomes alveolar dead space and the passage they do not have any exchanging membrane so the trachea the major bronchi the divisions all these things they become what is called anatomical or anatomic dead space and to so that if you use any anesthetic equipment then that is called mechanical dead space or apparatus dead space so this is an iatrogenic thing what we introduce so physiologically we have only two dead spaces anatomic and alveolar combined together it is called physiologic dead space so how is anatomical dead space measured how do you measure the anatomical dead space what test you can do or what uh, lab <coughs> method you can do so paulus method sir paulus method yes you have to remember that anatomical dead space is then measured by paulus method you ask the patient to inhale 100% of the in and you allow the expelled gases to be collected and plot it so the initial air will come from all the passages so when the expiration happens the first air to come out will be from the trachea bronchi the lobar bronchi all this passage air only will come so it has not taken place in any exit so it will come out as normal air so it will have the same 100% uh, oxygen so gradually it will go on increasing the nitrogen concentration will change accordingly and that is how the plotted thing will so first you will get uh, pure gas then mixed gas then last will be the alveolar gas so you can combine these pure gases will represent the anatomical dead space so in late 1940 with the development of rapidly responding nitrogen mixture ward fowler is the person who did that assembled the apparatus to measure the anatomical dead space utilizing measurement of exhaled nitrogen concentration immediately following inspiration of a breath a single breath of 100% oxygen so <clears throat> the fowler dead space measurement is dependent on the subject size also equal subjects ideal body weight in pounds now how is next question is how is physiological dead space measured by bohr's equation sir bohr's equation so the answer for this is this is not measured in practice 
but calculated using more equation very good so in 1891 a danish respiratory physiologist called christian bohr introduced his calculation to represent the volume of gas within the conducting airways that constituted the respiratory dead cells and he conceptually divided them into exhaled breath into two components the first is the exhaled breath participating in gas exchange and the second is dead space so alveolar ventilation and dead space ventilation so he named it as va alveolar gas and dead space gas then by tidal nature of ventilation the exhaled breath contains fraction of inspired gas that does not participate in gas exchange and becomes the dead space gas so this is the calculation that we use normally this is the vd is dead space volume is equal to tidal volume multiplied by arterial carbon dioxide minus entire carbon dioxide divided by arterial carbon dioxide tension so if you use this formula we can measure the dead space the physiological or alveolar dead space so this is a, a calculated formula it is not actually measured because these parameters you can measure you know the arterial carbon dioxide by doing abg you can measure entire carbon dioxide using a capnogram and you can measure the tidal volume music the spirometer so these values are measured and then use the formula so you calculate the dead space physiological dead space it is not actually measured now i am going to show you a picture here first one is showing bohr's approach second one is showing enhoff's approach can anyone tell me what is the difference between these two here they have shown how to calculate the physiological dead space this was originally done by bohr's approach but later a person called enhoff he modified bohr's approach now by looking at this picture can you tell me what are the differences you are seeing between these two in bohr's alveolar in carbon bohr's dioxide or... in engvom's arterial carbon dioxide excellent so why why this and what is the difference in these two graphs you see what is this what is this actually what is this uh, graph representing see what the gap it is a capnograph okay it is a capnograph without the drop it is showing only up to the peak uh, exhalation okay so this is a time the capnograph this is a volume cap so when the volume capnograph came into practice when it was introduced enhoff modified that it is very difficult to measure the alveolar carbon dioxide you have to go invasively and do that very difficult so uh, bohr used the capnograph and uh, tried to do that somewhere plotting it in the midway but when the volume capnograph came into practice and how was able to modify that by taking the arterial carbon dioxide which almost equal the exhaled carbon dioxide with a small difference of 3 to 5 mm of mercury so he was able to calculate accurately and he modified the both situation so physiological dead space nowadays is calculated by enhoff's modification of both equation so original discoverer was bohr but end of made a modification so this is the same thing what is the modification done in bo 1938 in recognition of problem obtaining a appropriate estimate of alveolar carbon dioxide using the bohr equation engo proposed the substitution of arterial carbon dioxide tension instead of the mean alveolar carbon dioxide estimate in the bo calculation and so all the calculations were done the term represent the anatomical dead space alveolar dead space was done now the mean pa o co2 is less than the pa o2 although the difference is quite small in normal means so both of them do not exactly mean match each other 
just as any gas exchange abnormality will increase the alveolar arterial oxygen difference the same statement holds good for arterial alveolar carbon dioxide difference also now how death phase happens in ARDS the patient develops ARDS how death phase happens in that We see a lot of background flashy opacities. All of you should recall what were all the uh, points by which you diagnose ARDS. It should be acute. Then the next abnormal measurement was due to regions with blocked microcirculation that remained ventilated. So alveolar uh, ventilated, but the capillary perfusion is not there. That is uh, secondary to creation of few alveolar dead space in addition to increased the uh, alveolar ventilation perfusion heterogeneity more likely to contribute to this what happens to dead space in patients with pulmonary hypertension causing a patient develops either a pul primary pulmonary hypertension or secondary to a vascular ventricular failure. Normal subjects ordinarily demonstrate at least 50% reduction in physiological death space during heavy exercise compared with their resting measurement. Whereas patients with pulmonary hypertension typically fail to show any reduction in death space during exercise despite demonstrating typical increases in tidal volume as the exercise intensity increases. What is the clinical significance of this change in various conditions? The dead space. The clinical significance is in lung disease. Emphysema destroys alveolar tissue, leads to air trapping, and decreased the diffusion of surface area and increasing the dead space volume. So, emphysema patients have an increase in dead space. ARDS produces again an increase in the space. EQ mismatch and decreased perfusion again they increase the dead space. And mechanical ventilation also increases the space by adding volume to effective space not participating in gas exchange. That is tubing from ventilated and all these things they increase the dead space. Heat. Excessive heat can over distant alveoli, resulting in barotrauma that also can increase the dead space. Hypoxia causes bron bronchoconstriction or vasoconstriction from hypoxia, they decrease the dead space because the ventilation also is uh, decreased and the, uh, the uh, uh, perfusion also is decreased. So it will uh, it is just some, something like a hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction replaced. Whenever there is a decrease in alveolar PO2, vasoconstriction occurs, and that is a uh, protective mechanism by decreasing the dead space. The anesthesia usually increases the dead space volume, and dead space is an integral part of volume capnography, which measures expired CO2 and the dead space also on breath by breath basis for efficient monitoring of patient ventilation. So majority of the conditions, pathological conditions, they increase their dead space volume, except hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, which decreases the dead space. And can pulmonary embolism be detected easily using this uh, method? Yes, because dead space and capnography can prove to be useful tools minimizing the unnecessary test by ruling out pulmonary embolism with simple capnographic measurement. So, whenever there is a decrease in total obstruction to blood flow by pulmonary embolism, there will be a sudden drop in APCO2, just like a cardiac arrest or a air embolism causing an acute sudden drop in APCO2, pulmonary embolism also will cause a sudden drop in APCO2. So there is an exponential decrease in CO2, this is how the picture will be, and the possible causes. This question I just put it for the sake of uh, OSCE. Sometimes they can give a capnographic picture like this for you to remember. So cardiopulmonary arrest, pulmonary embolism, 
sudden hypotension with ma- massive blood loss or cardiopulmonary bypass all these things can lead to decrease in epco2 which is the uh, cause of this factor so how this is caused the blood clot in the pulmonary vessel so there is no blood flow the uh, alveolar ventilation is there but there is no exchange so ca- carbon dioxide is not exhaled out so the gradual decrease in epco2 causing this problem so how na- high nasal flow helps to augment alveolar ventilation this is another question for the sake of asking how high nasal flow helps to augment alveolar ventilation this is connected to the dead space we give high nasal flow oxygen 15 liters 20 liters 30 liters how does it help to improve the alveolar ventilation and oxygen nasal high nasal flow allows dead space to be cleared the anatomical dead space is completely replaced with oxygen so uh, oxygenation definitely will go on improving because every breath when there is a change further drawing will be only 100% oxygen it will not be the dead space air so what what happens is you get a continuous flow of oxygen into the alveoli so naturally the inspired oxygen almost is 100% and patient will be able to oxygenate themselves very well so if you see here This is the pharyngeal and tracheal area where you have the uh, metabolical dead space is present. So when you give 45 liters per minute of na- nasal high flow oxygen, the entire dead space is replaced with 100% oxygen. So patient, whenever he feels more and more, the oxygen will go and no air with nitrogen will go. So patient will get very well oxygenated by high nasal. That is the mechanism of If they ask you in the practicals how high nasal flow helps it, it replaces or completely removes the anatomical dead space and fills that area with 100% oxygen. That is the answer, decreasing the portion of anatomical dead space. So coming to last part, then it's up and we will just discuss and close with this apparatus dead space, which is a very important practicals point for uh, those from uh, practicing an anesthesia as well as examination. What is apparatus dead space? How it is different from physiological dead space? Again, the answer is it is the dead space defined as resulting from devices placed between the endoscopic tube and the void piece of the breathing circuit. And it is the primary source of dead space controlled by the clinician so we can alter this volume by removing a part of the connectors or making them smaller or removing the length of the endotracheal tube by all these things we can alter so apparatus this space is under the control of the clinician and that space is created by the devices we place between the endotracheal tube and the white piece of the breathing circuit Now, what, why apparatus dead space is more important in infants and neonates? Whenever you... Consume the extra volume. Uh, uh, they are, volumes are already low. So, so the small tidal volume required by infants and neonates, it is very easy to create excessive apparatus dead space resulting in unintended hypercardia or increased mini ventilation to achieve a desired CPU. So we can easily produce a unnecessary dead space if we, we are not careful with that. That is why we select the ISTPs or the Jackson Reese modification for small babies because that has the lowest or negligible apparatus dead space. That is the reason why we always choose that particular structure for pediatric Now I am showing a few connectors which are here. Can you identify or name them? You have A, B, C, D, D. 
and I have given their uh, volume, which will create that amount of dead space. So this is uh, apparatus A is going to give 22 ml dead space. This is going to give 9 ml dead space. This is 8 ml dead space. This is 13 ml dead space, and this is 25 ml dead space. How many do you have to can identify each one? What is A? A is white connector, white piece. No, no, this is a filter. This is a filter with an infiltrator in and the connection for the tube. What is this for? This gap is open. ETC auto. ETC auto connection. Fantastic. Very good. That is for ETC auto connection. So this is a filter. So you can see this has got a maximum. Uh, you know, volume of 22 ml. So this 22 ml will be dead space because it will not cause any gas exchange. And what is this? This is another HME type of HME filter, HME filter. With, uh, uh, filter. filter with an adapter for ETCO2 monitoring. And what is this called? L connector, connector for the uh, it connecting. is an elbow connector with a, again adapter for ETCO2 connection. And what is B and D? I think most of you may not have seen it's this, but this is called a collapsible connector between the endotracheal tube and the circuit. So this is in a collapsed portion. If you stretch it, it becomes like this. So you can reduce the volume by collapsing it, which will become 30 ml. If you pull it and stretch it, it becomes 20 ml. Okay, so the car is the inside volume increases. This is a corrugated tubing which is collapsible. You can completely press it and make it smaller by reducing this to 13 ml. Okay. So where does the apparatus dead space end in the below shown circuit? This is a very common question asked in the examination. So I am showing pictures here. Can you tell me where the apparatus dead space ends? This is a Napleson D or the modification. If this is without another one, this is the modification, of course. Uh, Napleson R, circuit. So, in all these things, can you tell me where exactly the apparatus dead case ends? Now, here for this Napleson. This is the point uh, of entry the for until flow. the fresh gas flows. Ah, this is the point of entry for fresh gas flow. So the dead space will be here. Can you see my uh, arrow pointer yes, going up and down? Yes, so this sir. Yes, sir. So this is the L bend, and up to this only is the apparatus dead space. These things will not get included. So in any circuit, the point of entry of fresh gas flow is the location where apparatus dead space will end. And for main circuit, there is a fresh gas flow entry. Just uh, before entry the API here. Run. Okay, so this is the fresh gas flow. So okay. you know, it, it will end here itself. Again, as I told you here, this is the point of entry for here in Naples and D. And for main circuit, that point of entry comes almost to the tip. If you attach an endotracheal tube, it comes here. Okay, so only this portion is the dead space. And similarly, for this also, for pediatric uh, older type uh, ISTPs, this is the point of entry of fresh gas flow. So this is where the, this portion alone, either if it is attached to a mask or a ET tube, this is the apparatus dead space. So. The two locations which determine the apparatus dead space, the first one is the point of entry of fresh gas flow. The second one is for the location where the expiratory valve is located. For example, in Megil's circuit, Megil's A circuit or Maples in A circuit, even you have the expiratory valve close to the endotracheal tube or to the mask, that is where the apparatus dead space will so this is, you can see, this is the expiratory valve which will be equally attached to the middle circuit. 
So this point, beyond this point only is the apparatus dead space. Proximal to that, which is attached to the machine, will not be a dead space. Okay, so these are the points that we have to remember in this. So I think uh, we have only a period of time in it. So I will stop here. Then, uh, do you have any questions? Any doubts? Okay. okay. Oh. Sir, one doubt, sir. Ah, please ask. Sir, what is the dead space in uh, closed circuit, sir? Closed circuit, there is no dead space because you are rebreathing all the HL gases without carbon dioxide. So, only if Did you it? allow any patient to breathe spontaneously, then the HL dual position will become dead space. Otherwise, in closed circuit, there is no dead space at all. All the exhaled gases are rebreathed after the carbon dioxide is removed. So there is no net space in your circuit. Which means you are supposed to strictly keep all the valves closed and use a very low flow anesthesia. But in practice, majority of us, what we do is we keep a higher flow and keep the valve partially open. But even then, the dead space is not. Uh, I in closer. Am I clear? Thanks, sir. Any other question? Yes, sir. Okay. Any other questions?